thank you Ram Raj and thank you Jennifer for joining us today. Welcome everyone to the first round table of day 4 at Prabhav 2020. This is Neha from the ISE team and it is my pleasure to welcome you all. This round table discussion is on education to discuss perspectives from our influencers of the sector. During the session, we would be hearing from not only the investors, but the social enterprises themselves on education, technology, and lending financing. We are joined by 10 eminent speakers today. I will quickly take two minutes to introduce the moderator of the session and be out of your way. This session is going to be moderated by Namita Dalmia, who is the Director of Investments at Omidyar Network India. Namita leads strategy and investments in education. She has also worked with the National Knowledge Commission supporting the Prime Minister's office to develop policy encompassing education and related areas. Owen, as you know, is one of the most prolific impact investors globally as well as in India and it's a pleasure to have you moderate the session, Namita. Over to you. Thank you, Neha. I'm equally excited to moderate the panel on education. I'm, as Neha mentioned, I'm joined by a great set of colleagues who have a lot of rich perspectives to offer. So very quick introduction for them. Uh, maybe, maybe the panelists can wave their hands as I'm talking about them so, so people can put the faces to the names. So Prachi, Prachi Windlers, she's the director at Michael and Susan Dent Foundation. And they, the Dell Foundation focuses on transforming the lives of children living in urban poverty through improved education, health, and family economic stability. We're also joined by Abhijit Nath, uh, Country Manager in Citadel Impact Asia Fund. Uh, the fund's objective is to contribute to the development of a fair and inclusive marketplace that serves the prevalent unmet needs of rural communities. Aditi Gupta, Principal in Investments at Asha Impact. Uh, the, Asha Impact was founded in 2014 by Vikram Gandhi and Pramod Haseen as a network of like-minded business leaders and philanthropists to leverage their collective expertise, networks, and capital for social impact. Pradeep Sharma, who is representing Vedantu. Uh, Vedantu is an Indian interactive online tutoring platform where teachers provide tuitions to students over the internet using a real-time virtual learning environment being made. Dhandavar, uh, she's the head social finance at UPS. Optimus Foundation. Uh, the foundation takes a unique approach which takes advantage of their network and drives impactful philanthropy that delivers breakthrough solutions to social and environmental issues. Uh, Nira is a partner at Kaizen West. Uh, they're one of the leading private equity focused on education um, sector um, and they, they made uh, a number of, uh, number of investments in, in the space. Sorry, my notes. Uh, then I'm joined by Ronald Sujan, who is the Managing Director and Co-Founder of Raga Holdings. Ronald has over 20 years of experience across India and Asia, and he has worked closely as independent strategic advisors, working with different entrepreneurs. Um, having a bit of trouble, uh, that always occurs. Um, I'm also joined by Sumit Mehta, who is the CEO and founder of Lead Schools. He will be talking to us about uh, the Lead Schools business model in more detail. Uh, Pratik Shukla, who is the CEO and founder of Masai School, uh, working in the upskilling space. I hope I have not missed anyone here and covered everyone. Seems like so. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, I welcome everyone and uh, we, we will get started. The session is divided into three parts. First part, first section we'll talk about EdTech, we'll look at the overview in the sector, uh, which I will present. And then uh, our panelists will uh, talk about some innovative business models that they've seen, um, examples, the tailwinds, as well as the impact in the sector. Uh, the second section is, is on uh, blended financing, where uh, our panelists will talk, us, talk about the examples and what does it mean for risk investors, uh, what outcomes have we been able to achieve, and how we think about scaling the blended financing in education. In the third section, our entrepreneurs uh, will talk about their respective business models, taking us uh, into the really like what does what do their different what what their respective business models look like, and how have they impacted lives of uh, students as well as how are they looking at financial evidence as well as their own perspectives on the sector um, on, on their respective sectors so with that uh, 
let, let us get started on the first section. I would like to present my uh, screen, sort of, if, if you can help me with that. Uh, can you see my screen? Can one, someone? Yes, we can. Superb. Yeah, so as um, at Omidya Network India, we focus on what we call the next half billion people. These are the people who are coming out of the poverty now. They represent the Aspirus segment. And they're also the people who are using, getting on smartphone for the first time and accessing products and solutions uh, using smartphones. Uh, so, so with that, keep, as EdTech Wave was growing, with that keeping in mind, we thought with, uh, of doing an exercise along with Red Seer last year, um, which or to understand what will it take uh, entrepreneurs to build uh, better solutions for this segment and uh, and build uh, build solid business models as well this this particular re research surveyed 3200 customers across k12 and post k12 there were 150 in depth interviews with customers and 25 interviews with edtech entrepreneurs including with not for profits we also uh, interviewed 10 plus in uh, edtech investors and also did a review of the Google Play uh, comments of uh, of apps to really see what what consumer feedback some of you know, in general on edtech we are seeing from the consumers as they are coming on board. So I'll I'll, I'll do a very quick two min, uh, five minutes on this. So as we know, just to set the stage, there are 308 million students across schools and colleges. Bulk of them are in schools. Only with 25% gross enrollment ratio in colleges, we are still uh, at only 40 million uh, students in colleges. This is itself expected to grow to 325 million. Uh, our hope is with the national education policy being um, put in place well, this, the growth in post K-12 will also increase. And hopefully India will also achieve the gross enrollment ratio of 50% that has been in such. Uh, of these people, what we saw that edtech users, when we say users, it's both free or paid. Uh, there they were about 45 million people who are accessing edtech in any form, including YouTube education. And this number we expect, we expected, and this is all pre-COVID we did um, the research, we expected this number to grow to 150 million. And major, uh, majority of them will come from K-12, but 27% coming from post-K-12. In terms of just the market size itself, we saw... Um, um, we all know that there's about $90 billion market expenditure in private education. This does not include the government expenditure, which is about, again, roughly the same. And this this itself will grow to $126 billion, uh, driven by both increasing enrollment and expenditure. Um, in terms of the paid edtech users, we estimated that two and a half, while there are two and a half million of 45 million people up were paying for edtech in 2019, this number will increase to 20 million. And 40% uh, of this will come from post k uh, Some interesting insights. Uh, sorry. Some interesting insights in terms of K-12. Uh, in terms of just the market size, around 270 to 60 million dollars was the revenue of, from all the educated tech companies. This is B2C um, in 2019, and we expected this to grow to 1.7. Billion dollars. Uh, we also estimated that the NHV segment itself will grow 33x to get to 400 million dollars and become about 24 percent. So that that really means that there is a large opportunity sitting right there, which is which is right now untapped. The other interesting fact, uh, interesting thing that we uh, uh, saw was grades one to five, which is largely untapped today, will grow the maximum and will create a large opportunity uh, as well. Here, uh, again, uh, we saw that parents across the income segments were looking for solutions beyond academics and want to focus on holistic development. So again, uh, so something to think about as um, entrepreneurs build solutions for grade one to five. Uh, Post-K-12, which was around $472 million, will again also grow to $1.8 billion. Online higher education was we estimated to grow to about a billion dollars, and again, I think as the regulations start easing up, this number can grow much faster and bigger. Um, one other thing that we noticed was NHB, while is a key uh, target segment for many of the companies, right now there is a lot uh, to be desired 
in terms of the NPS from when we uh, dissected the NPS from the NHP versus the uh, middle income and rich segment, we saw there is a huge gap. And the key things we heard from the NHP segment that companies need to help them demonstrate outcomes, provide assisted learning solutions and not just self-learning solution, as well as provide multilingual content in order to cater to their demand. So there is there is also, while there is a demand, there is a there is more work to be done by the tech companies in order to uh, reach the segment uh, very well. Uh, interesting thing on COVID-19, some additional tailwinds we saw while the research was done by the end of 2019. Let's did another quick survey and saw um, that the 45 million uh, it tech users that I was talking about going up to 150 million, already by April, this number had reached 90 million. Similarly, the two and a half million of paid users had already grown, grown to 4.6 million. Uh, having said that, I understand that some of this would have fallen off uh, as the lockdown is easing up. But uh, our estimate is the companies who've innovated really well and are showing the outcomes, their paths, their journeys have accelerated and uh, the tailwind is really real for them. There's a lot of insights that we got through our report and I don't want to take up the, the, the all the time today, uh, but there were key, there were key uh, eight insights that we uh, put together on the K-12 side, whether it is on, um, even starting from that, given the diversity, there will be multiple winners uh, in the online education market. And there's an opportunity for both existing and new entrepreneurs to build businesses. Pricing came out as an important one. Uh, while there is, uh, while 60 percent of people wanted to pay, they, they thought pricing is still uh, prohibitive. So there is, uh, so that means two things. One, that either the ed tech needs to become the primary source and the parents and the students do not completely replace the offline with the online and that that may make it work or unbundle the product and make the pricing really affordable. Similarly, on the high value sales, uh, today the feed on the street sales model is not um, leads itself to high CAC and and high pricing. Uh, can entrepreneurs really start thinking about product based uh, distribution and really uh, and they will have to think about low CAC strategy in order to reach the NHP. Um, Again, uh, all of these insights in much more detail is available in the report. So I'm going to just uh, quickly uh, move to the post K-12. Um, uh, here, particularly, we saw that uh, the adult learners are also looking for assistance in social interaction. And uh, about 56% of people said that. And that needs to be part of the model. And, and that's where a model like Coursera and Udemy, while uh, reaching large number of people, if uh, if it's only self-learning, it, it, it wouldn't work, but their new models uh, where they're engaging will work better. Um, similarly, the people who are, uh, they're, they're people who are willing to pay uh, for technical skilling, right? They're, they're people who go to colleges and spend anything between one to four lakhs per year on their college education, but they they come back with nothing. And they, they are, a lot, lot of these people are also paying for technical skilling, but they need they need you, uh, the companies to support them in career development and not just leave them at the learning outcomes. Um, they also rely a lot on what their peers say. So, so or they actually go on job portals and see uh, where are people finding jobs, what are, what, do, what are those forums saying. So there's also an opportunity to really think about where to target and find the people and really position your product uh, accordingly. And last but not the least, uh, the life skills, uh, both technical and life skills training will be an important part of employability outcomes. So something to keep in mind as entrepreneurs think about building businesses. Um, here is the link for the report. It's available on our uh, website so people can access. Um, and we are happy to, uh, to be in touch and provide more insights on what we have learned through this exercise. With that, uh, now let me, um, let me now invite Abhijit, Aditi, and Ronel um, as panelists to share their perspective on the ethics sector. Um, so my first question to you is to you, Aditi. How have you seen the ethics landscape evolve in the last couple of years? And it'll be great to hear some ideas of you know, innovations that you have seen. Uh, too. And if you can highlight those for the audience. Thanks so much, Namita, and uh, what a fantastic presentation. I think leaves a lot of food for thought for not just uh, the audience, but also the panelists themselves. 
Um, so, you know, something that you talked of in the presentation as well, right? The edtech landscape has seen massive evolution over the last few years. Uh, when I think back to uh, all the way to 2013, 14, when one wanted to invest in education, uh, the only kind of business models you would find are businesses selling through schools uh, who had no control over customer acquisition or, you know, customer engagement or uh, training models which were dependent on NSTC and were stuck with very long working capital cycles, right? So um, I think we've come a long way uh, from there, driven by, of course, the compression in device and uh, data costs. Uh, the three big trends or, uh, you know, uh, sort of categories of businesses that we see evolving are uh, one is really what you also mentioned, which was uh, unbundling, right? All these consumer businesses that we see today have done a fantastic job of, uh, you know, coming up with very catered value propositions. Uh, for example, whether it's doubt solving, interview preparation, career counseling, right? Each of these things is now a business model in its own right, right? The second business uh, model that we see evolving is really the whole, uh, you know, SaaS tools for edtech, right? So whether it's, uh, you know, admissions management for schools or parent-teacher engagement or placement management uh, for colleges or taking coaching uh, institutions online. Uh, bringing efficiency uh, in all of these players is really about improving the end customer experience. So we're very excited about, you know, seeing all of these uh, sort of spade uh, businesses also come into play. And the third big enabler that we see in the market is really innovation around, uh, you know, student financing. So, uh, you know, we have uh, Masai here and they'll be speaking about their uh, business model. And um, so ISA and pay after placement is, of course, one uh, which leads to sort of overall democratization of access. But you also have student lenders who are now partnering with institutes to really underwrite the student on their, uh, you know, on her future potential rather than depending on underwriting the parent, right? Because that's the fundamental premise of education, right? That it's a tool to get a leg up. So why should access be restricted to families where they have collateral to pony up as, uh, you know, for a student loan? So uh, innovation on that front is also a very exciting uh, trend that we see. Um, I'll hand it over to Abhijit to maybe uh, add his thoughts. Sure. Uh, no, those are great. That's a great framework to sort of work with. Um, you know, uh, just adding to that, I think what we've seen so far is really... Uh, solving for the customer acquisition problem, uh, as Aditi mentioned, where, you know, uh, we had this huge problem of saying through schools, your your entire acquisition cycle was two months and then the rest of the year, you know, you just tried to service the same customer. That has fundamentally changed. And of course, COVID has had a significant impact on that, uh, where people are actually that are happy to sign up for things online and actually stick with them for some time. Uh, I think the next piece that I think China has done significantly over the last 10 years, I guess, is, is really product innovation post that, where uh, what you engage with actually adds value substantially. Uh, the report as well, you know, you see sort of NPS course tapering off. Uh, I think that innovation is still is still tricky. And I think it's, it's, at some level, it's not that people aren't willing to build great products. It's just that uh, parents aren't, aren't evolving quickly enough either. Um, there is still resistance to uh, teaching core values, which is why you have to sort of sell more exciting sort of, uh, you know, quick uh, ideas like, you know, your son will become a coder with uh, $100,000 of salary or whatever. Uh, but that product innovation and really getting to basic concepts uh, will sort of uh, speed up quite substantially in the next few years, uh, which is at this moment happening through those micro products like doubt solving and so on that I mentioned, uh, but will probably scale up it as as money gets spent on product development in the edge space. Uh, it's still some amount of sort of retrofitting of the models we've seen, which are classroom based um, or teacher to student based. I think that will evolve substantially. Um, the third is, uh, you know, I think all of this has been um, limited to the K-12 space and more specifically sort of leading into the test prep space uh, in grades 9 to 12. Um, that is because that's probably the only time where students are self-motivated to pay and parents have FOMO obviously of, um, you know, let's, uh, let's pay to get him into a good college. Uh, I think where we will start seeing a lot more excitement is in, in college and in vocational. Um, where I think there's actually a, a, a huge need and a huge space, white space really, um, that's that's still available, especially in the college space. Uh, I think the West is already starting to 
asked this question around uh, why am I spending a hundred thousand dollars a year to go to college? Is there something else? Um, I think we'll start seeing that substantially. Things like coding, especially, I think um, the traditional college experience will be subsumed by something else. I don't know what that is. I'd love to invest in it, but uh, uh, that will start to happen quite substantially. Similarly, in vocational, where um, skills are more important than qualifications, if there are good ways to sort of uh, take that online, um, I think they'll happen. And I think it's easier to prove the case for that and for um, you know companies to hire more easily from there as well because they're not bothered about what the top line of your CVP is. Uh, I'll pause there. Yeah, let me ask Ronan now. But according to you, Ronan, our tailwinds in EdTech, both growth traction that you are seeing with companies and the capital. Oh, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat that, uh, Anika? Uh, the tailwinds in the EdTech sector that you are seeing, uh, okay terms of growth as well as the capital that they are attracting. Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you to Neha and Ramraj and the IIC for inviting me here and uh, it's really a pleasure to be part of the very distinguished panel. Uh, let me provide a bit of a different perspective uh, from Singapore because in Singapore people look at China as well, they look at India as well and essentially uh, both are extremely exciting markets. I mean the way I see it is that India is probably five years behind China when it comes to ed tech. Uh, the funds raised for Chinese ed tech companies in 2015 were about $2.5 billion, uh, which is what the amount is for Indian companies in 2020. Uh, so I think, you know, we are five years behind uh, China and uh, both markets are equally scalable. I think what India has going for it is its ca capacity to be able to scale overseas uh, simply because the Indian teachers can, you know, address an international audience as well because of the English language. I think from a cultural standpoint as well, uh, education is a core value both for the Indians and the Chinese. So I think both markets are extremely exciting for edtech. Apart from the COVID tailwinds, I think the other factors obviously are the emergence of technologies, uh, uh, which is playing a key role in the disruption of the education space. Uh, the uh, reinvention of learning models, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, the personalized learning, the, game, the gamification that is happening in education, uh, the social learning where learning is becoming a social phenomena. I think these are all key trends uh, that are contributing to the tailwinds. Uh, and all this is resulting in more capital coming into India. I think uh, the positioning of education being an impact sector and the importance being placed on sustainability by most investors today is uh, creating a huge flood of capital coming into the space in India. If you look at companies in India that have recently been funded, if you take Baiju, for instance, which is valued at 12 billion, and you look at the entire funding cycle, you have examples of a family office in there, you have a you know, venture capital in there, you have a private equity fund, you have a foundation. So I think the entire uh, you know, value chain of the, of the funding industry is participating in ed tech. Uh, you know, simply because of the sustainability angle, the impact angle, and the fact that there's a lot of innovation happening in there, and obviously that is a global business model. So, uh, you know, at the extent of... Have we lost? ...that uh, make it a very exciting industry. Great. So, actually, let me bring you in, Prachi, given that there is also a demand that we see from the public school system, especially in the pandemic. Um, if you can spend maybe a minute to, to share some of the learnings that you have uh, supporting the state government's uh, news and tech, and what do you see as the potential there? Yeah, thanks, Namita. And that was a fabulous presentation that you started us off with. And the numbers in the government systems are actually even more, uh, even more stunning because you know, we're still going, growing uh, from 45 million to what your number was. I mean, in government, you're actually literally growing from zero. So we started with the base of literally no kids, no parents, nobody on any platform and you know, now we're seeing millions of kids. So through uh, you know, Dell Foundation's portfolio, the starkest and the biggest shift that I've seen is in the state of Himachal, where at the beginning of the pandemic, again, starting from zero, we have roughly uh, half a million kids in the state and 70% of them, so you know, 350,000, 400,000 kids are already on a asynchronous uh, learning tool, uh, which, is, which is just WhatsApp. So there is no fancy ed tech over there, it is just WhatsApp. That is, again, the key, uh, Namita, in working with the government, you know, familiar and simple 
is the key to work with them but that itself is a big shift right for from having no one using it tech in any form to everyone in the value chain using so first of all the department having this point of view that now we should be sending content uh, videos whatever so you know they fully collaborated they have a full content library customized for them they they have actually tagged it to their syllabus that they were teaching and every week over whatsapp teachers formed groups with kids and they are sending this content out and all the parents are connected because the content is actually going to the parents phones we are talking about uh, you know k12 kids here so overnight within uh, two weeks or three weeks everybody from the department to the teachers to the parents and kids they were using the system and a lot of it dropped off after the parents went back to work and the device is no longer available but a lot of them shifted to using it from morning hours to late hours uh, so so 70% is what we are seeing we are finding almost 100% engagement on the 70% who are there so we send a weekly quiz on saturdays uh, all the kids take that quiz which is the point that aditi was saying that you know unbundling and really making it uh, a simple single use app is what is getting the traction in the public sector and finally the what i do see continuing a lot after this are three things i think teacher training and using technology more and more for that because the efficiency of using teacher uh, tech for teacher training was always there but has become evident uh, to the entire system so i do think that will happen in a big way uh, continuing with assessments over technology many of these states are doing whatsapp based bot based quizzes to be able to get the data whether kids are being able to learn or not that is continuing and some form of extending the kids school day through this newer medium which has become available i think will continue you know versus anything dramatic and drastic happening very hard to predict infrastructure always becomes a bottleneck in the government classrooms so i'm i won't take any bets on that but everybody seeing the benefit of being able to get into the kids school day like extending that school day by getting into your home part of learning and whether it be whatsapp based simple apps open platforms uh, all our all our options over there but but i think that trend too will continue super uh, uh, given the moving in transition into the second part but you know these are um, these are great insights and i think when we come back to the entrepreneurs we'll get to get uh, deeper look into some of the business models so um, on the blended financing i would like to invite one kachi and nira then if i may ask you to set the stage on blended finance in education sectors your perspectives as risk investors on both returns uh, while driving outcomes and scale what scale is possible So, if you could maybe provide your comments on that, and then we'll go to Prachi um, to talk about role of assessments. What results have you seen? Maybe for an example, and Nira, um, if you can give an example of the facility that you guys have been working as an example of scale here. Excellent. Thanks, Namita. Um, so, speaking about blended finance in the education sector. um now even though uh, we know that uh, arguably education is one of the best ways to achieve sustainable development uh globally the share of education aid has been steadily declining and now unesco warns us that the funds needed to achieve quality education and access for all uh, will significantly increase over the next couple of years while total aid is set to decline by say 12% by 2022 as a result of economic consequences of covid um so the education system as we see it uh, globally and in india does face uh, a triple shock one is household income is being impacted and as house household expenditure increases there is diver diversion of spending from education uh there is a drop in donor funding as well as government funding so while the very existence of education organizations might be currently at threat exacerbated by uh, by covid um solidarity funding is key and extremely important but it is also on a more positive note a real opportunity for innovation in education finance and that's where um we see that blended finance 
results-based financing can play a significant role. What it does is that it can enable better and more effective use of the funding pool that is available and bring also private capital to play towards achieving learning outcomes. So in my opinion, it's, it's actually quite a critical and almost pivotal moment for innovation and education finance uh, currently. Now, at the Optimus Foundation, what we've been doing is, of course, we've been funding blended finance, um, pay for success for, for many years now, uh, through a variety of, of models and really testing them in different contexts. So public-private partnerships in Liberia, for example, with the Liberia Education Advancement Program, looking at the Education Outcomes Fund in Africa, uh, two specific dibs in, uh, in India, and the Social Success Note in Uganda, which is focused on in improving school attendance. If you look at the global impact bond market, there are currently 26 impact bonds focused specifically on education, two of which have been in India. The first being the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond, which closed out successfully exceeding expectations. And the second is the Quality Education India Development Impact Bond, which is halfway through implementation, having seen stellar results in years one and two. And Prashi will dive a little bit more into assessment and results. So um, uh, we look forward to hearing from her on that shortly. Uh, but all that to say that um, there is, there is great momentum and potential for blended finance currently, uh, particularly um, almost a moment to shine uh, in the current context. Now, we've been funding, of course, the design and piloting of these uh, instruments um, uh, for some time, and but also have played the role of a risk investor, providing upfront capital in the programs that I that I mentioned. So, as you said, you know, what as a risk investor have been our insights and experiences on the two topics, returns and scale. We talk about uh, returns, it's very important to make, make sure that uh, there is alignment between returns and driving learning outcomes, as you mentioned. And I think there are three key things that we look at there. One is, of course, identifying social enterprises to invest in, where the business model and uh, social impact are directly related. And therefore, as social impact increases, so does the business grow. The second is looking at outcomes-based funding. So develop an impact bonds, for example, where the incentives of all the actors involved uh, can be aligned and therefore drive better learning outcomes. And then outcomes focus has an added advantage of having built in uh, the optionality of specific targeting and enhancing equity. When what I mean by that is with outcomes funding, you can actually um, use outcome pricing to target the program. So pay a higher price for programs that work more so with girl students, for example. And finally, the, the third thing is linking um, education outcomes to potential bonus payments. So this is in a non-outcomes based um, um, structure where you could actually create a financial incentive um, if the program does achieve uh, additional outcome, education outcomes that are not necessarily um, uh, directly correlated to the financial returns. So this is something we've been trying out, like an impact carry um, in um, an e education um, facility in, in Africa, for example, with uh, together with Acumen. So I think those are three key ways that you can look at aligning returns and, and, um, and outcomes. And then just quickly, Namita, to your uh, question on scale, right? So how, how can we scale and how do you take, uh, is there potential for outcomes funding to, to go to scale? And there are three key things or key three, uh, three key drivers that we think are important um, for these um, outcome-based funding and then finance mechanisms to scale. Quality, quantity, and knowledge. And so when I say quality, it is um, about improving the, um, the capacities of service providers and social enterprises operating in the space. So providing patient capital, uh, investing in capacity support, investment readiness, outcomes funding readiness. The second is quantity. So mobilizing more funding from private and public sources <clears throat> that is specifically focused on outcomes. And then knowledge, of course, sharing best practices and um, building evidence. And so on that topic, I, um, I'll, I'll take pause here and actually hand over to Prachi who, um, to share some insights on, on evidence and, um, and assessment and results. Thanks, Namita. Thanks, Dan, for setting it up so well. Uh, let me take from what, uh, what Dan just alluded to as stellar results. So there has been almost uh, 
3x achievement of targets in in the development impact bond that uh, UBS Optimist Foundation us and uh, the British Asia Trust are working on and uh, and that's where i think the exciting part of all these uh, pay for performance models lie that what is it that is getting done differently that the same service provider or the same education company or the same school in this construct can actually achieve higher and we have extended these uh, uh, pay for performance constructs not just in the context of the uh, not for profit sector all the participants in the dip are ngos but also in affordable private schools uh, which you know where also we are seeing very good results so um, so the underlying theme that we find is that you know the biggest thing that it does is one it actually measures an outcome and puts it out there as the biggest thing at stake the achievement of it as biggest thing at stake because that level of clarity and focus just does not come in any other form of structuring so we as impact investors will invest in an entity with the objective of impact but once you invested there's so many other things happening that really impact is not front and center of saying this is the one thing that you have to go and achieve all of these blended finance uh, models whatever is the outcome that we've all agreed to the whole coalition the, all the stakeholders are just talking about this one thing um so like than said i think before designing the dip throughout the two or three years that dip has been active that's the only conversation which is happening that you know have you achieved your outcomes or not um so that's one thing and that means different things for different participants so in in the development impact bond the biggest thing at stake for the not for profit partners is that their reputation is at stake right i mean their results have never been so public their outcomes have never been so crucially measured and put out there uh, but similarly what we found in the, we've done a very similar experiment with affordable private schools uh, with vartana where we subsidized the interest rate upon achievement of learning outcomes for the private schools and neera will talk a bit more about it on how they're extending this concept through kaizen west we again found uh, close to 75% schools achieving their target you know and we found almost 2x higher outcome achievement than what we usually see in uh, uh, in budget private schools as the outcome achievement so there it's much more that financial incentive and what forms the bedrock of all of this work are good quality assessments in the case of education related pay for performance models uh before you can even set target you actually need a wealth of data on what is an achievable target in these schools so uh, fortunately in the case of uh, when we were designing the qdi dip we actually had that data available for several not for profits over several years which um, helped us set, uh, do that outcome pricing that than was talking about not only to say that you know you need to improve on this scale by 5 percentage point in a year but also to say okay 5 percentage point at 6000 rupees per child or 10 percentage point at 13000 rupees per child right so you really need that kind of data to be able to structure it so more and more in this conversation and i think what's relevant for this group and all our um, listeners out there is are we creating that knowledge base evidence base as we are moving forward right to say not just how much is achievable and what is good enough but also really what is the cost of achieving that and then you know then you can start pricing outcome as an asset almost and uh, and i think the second thing i would say in assessments is that when you are the pioneers in that kind of work then um, both measurement is expensive and uh, just building the ecosystem around it is expensive when we had started our work you know there was probably one assessment agency in india now maybe there are three or four but which also means is that you know everything is getting customized being done for these a uh, particular pilots so the assessment cost to begin with is high it is also not a public good which unlike countries like us and others where you know you don't have to go and measure there will be public data available uh, public assessments are state conducts assessments on kids here it will all be privately funded so so i think for us if time permits namita question to deliberate upon as a group is how does that happen uh, in the context of impact investing in india who bears that cost and uh, and you know how can we develop on that further but um, 
but I think I'll transition to Nirav with that saying that at least what we have found so far in our work with Dib as well as on our work in affordable private school financing is that blended finance works and the question is uh, how do we scale it from here, what components of it can be scaled and uh, Kaiser Invest is doing some interesting work on that uh, in putting together that scaled structure. Thank you, Prachi. Thanks for setting that up for me. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, IIIC for having me here. And also, uh, Namita, for this uh, fantastic panel. Actually, what Dhan and Prachi mentioned uh, set the perfect uh, context for what we've set out to achieve at Kaizen West. Uh, Kaizen West, we are education focused investors with uh, investments in South and Southeast Asia and now also in Africa. Uh, made about 14 unique investments till date, uh, raised about $150 million. And these investments span across uh, all learning stages, uh, tech, non-tech, and also very interestingly, uh, investment in uh, education finance of affordable uh, uh, non-state schools through Vartana. And that sort of became the basis of what we've set out to achieve through this new impact debt fund focused on the affordable learning ecosystem that we're creating. Uh, why are we doing that? Uh, perhaps three reasons. First of all, we know there's a huge learning crisis across the world. Right? World Bank says that 53% of our children are learning poor because they can't read or write at the age appropriate level. And the governments, where the problem is the most acute, simply just don't have the resources to be able to address this issue. Now, in the midst of all this over the last several decades, one form of uh, private sector participation that has really become quite popular is the proliferation of affordable private or affordable non-state players. And in countries like India, for example, today, 40% of all our school going children attend one or other of these affordable non-state institutions. Now, while all that is going on, uh, here comes COVID. And COVID has this absolutely devastating impact on this sector, which anyway got very little by way of state support. As a matter of fact, there's always this tussle going on between state and non-state around whether, first of all, non-state should exist or not, and then what level of regulation is right for non-state to flourish. But the fact remains that governments across the world have uh, willingly accepted that non-state is extremely important to have as part of the education infrastructure. But now with COVID, the problem is the income of these non-state organizations has just completely vanished. Right? And any attempt on their part is actually met with a lot of skepticism in form of resistance uh, for collection towards collection of fees even when online classes are offered. Now, if this sector remains in this state, then that's going to have a very significant negative impact on the overall education attainment, SDG 4 attainment of any country, including India. So it is in this context that we've set out this debt impact product specifically to support these non-state players in these tough times. In terms of the salient features of this product, uh, first of all, it's a blended finance instrument. So there is commercial return seeking capital, which fuels the underlying debt activity. But on top of that, there is philanthropic capital that does two things. One, it allows for capacity building of these non-state players, but more importantly, it rewards and recognizes those entities that are able to demonstrate a sustained improvement in learning outcomes. Now, this is exactly what Prachi mentioned about and also then mentioned in form of outcome-based financing, right? So here, the philanthropic capital only goes to those entities that have already succeeded in demonstrating learning outcomes improvement. So it's in the truest sense, outcomes-based financing. Uh, so that's the rule of blended capital. The second thing is there's a very strong underlying theory of change, uh, which has gone into the design of this instrument. And uh, this theory of change has actually gone through a very heavy scrutiny 
by one of the largest multilateral agencies in the world. And I'm glad to say that with this multilateral agency, we've actually kicked off uh, this product in uh, South Africa. Uh, so great example of India originated South-South collaboration. The third aspect that I'd like to highlight is that the impact measurement and management has been uh, very carefully defined uh, for this particular product. Uh, so much so that actually, uh, like uh, when you mentioned, here uh, the carry is linked to the achievement of impact outcomes. And so the manager is also equally incentivized to ensure that impact outcomes are achieved. And uh, the last aspect that I'd like to highlight about this product is the fact that it operates at scale. So essentially 100 million plus uh, kind of an instrument. And uh, that has a couple of distinct advantages for the investors. First of all, because it is a large instrument, it cuts across countries and therefore allows for geographic risk diversification for uh, the uh, risk investors. So, uh, for example, in our case, um, there's an Asia fund which cuts across India, Pakistan, Indonesia and Sri Lanka. Uh, there's a South Africa fund and there's also uh, advanced stages of uh, formation of a Sub-Saharan Africa fund that goes beyond just uh, uh, South Africa. So that's one big advantage. The other advantage of having scale is that it allows us to accommodate investors with very different kinds of uh, risk return profiles. So we have at the uh, junior tier, we have the DFIs who uh, want to use this as an opportunity for market making. Right? So they are willing to have a larger risk, but then they also would expect commensurate returns. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, uh, low risk uh, seeking investors such as financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, who are investing uh, with the assurance that their capital is being protected by the uh, more uh, subordinated tranches and they're able to earn a debt-like return, which uh, they are quite happy with because the impact case here is extremely strong. Uh, so that's the uh, instrument, uh, we call it Kaizenvest Edu Finance, uh, which we've uh, uh, launched in the market. So thank you. Thank you for that. Back to you, Namita. Thank you so much. This was an excellent uh, presentation and perspective. So now the one of the most awaited parts to our entrepreneurs who are the rock stars making it all happen. Uh, so we will start with uh, you, Sumit. And, you know, uh, and we have about 45 minutes in all, including Q&A. So, um, so I'll, I, I will manage time. So maybe, maybe if, if, like I'll, if there's one minute left, you know, uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, some signal there, but we will start with each one of you to talk about the business model. Really, what are you building? Uh, what is working? You know, what is your future plan? Uh, and you have about six minutes uh, to cover that, and then we'll come back to each one of you again in terms of your sector level perspectives. So let's start with Sumit, uh, then Pratik, and then Pradeep. Uh, maybe in that order we will go. Hi, thanks, Namita. Uh, I'm going to pick up uh, one of the data points that you mentioned in terms of the number of students who go to school in India, uh, you know, 260 million odd, uh, going to 1.5 million schools. Uh, our estimate is that out of them, 250 million still get a poor education. And I think one of our pet peeves has been that our expectations of outcomes has been have been fairly low uh, and pegged at basic literacy and numeracy. Uh, and India is not going to become, uh, you know, achieve its true potential if we still keep our outcome expectation at that level. So the question really that we've been trying to answer is that a student spends about six hours a day in a school. That's like 1.5 billion student hours wasted every day. Uh, colossal waste of a nation's potential. And we wanted to transform these six hours at school. Uh, the challenge has been that traditional schools have been built as one is to 40 mass education kind of factories. Uh, and because of the structure and design of a school, teaching ends up happening at the level of this mythical average student, right? So the question really comes up that how do we personalize each child's learning path so that each of them is able to achieve their true potential? 
I mean, it's a it's a hard problem to solve. That's why it's unsolved for the last seventy years. But but it's possible. Uh, it just requires us to reimagine how learning happens at school. And traditionally, this has been done by school consultants or trainers who work with schools to improve their processes, train teachers, select learning resources, and then help them improve their learning outcomes. But this approach has been very expensive, so it's out of bounds for affordable private schools. And the gains, even for the high fee schools, are not sustainable once the personnel involved change. So what's needed is a system of schooling that brings about sustainable transformation, and it needs to be affordable for it to work for the large number of schools in India. And and that's where Lead School comes in. It's a school integrated system that delivers excellent outcomes at an affordable cost to schools. Uh, our our business model is fairly simple we partner with schools to transform them into centers of excellence by implementing what we call the lead school integrated system and we charge them on a per student basis so a school basically needs to have their building transport furniture teachers and students and the lead school integrated system takes care of everything else for all the stakeholders and through our integrated suite of you know courseware software and hardware we implement a full stack system in schools and all this happens at a cost that is lower than what the school would pay to all the different vendors partners if they would have to take on uh, to get the benefits we provide uh, for us we began this journey by running our own schools where smita and i used to teach uh, but in the last 3 years we've grown from running our own five schools to now partnering with over 900 schools across india serving about 3.5 lakh students and about 7000 teachers uh, a typical school partner would charge between 18000 to 25000 per student per year fee a typical student household is a single single income with a father being a blue collar worker local trader or local government employee who himself is vernacular medium educated you know till class 12th or graduation mother is homemaker semi literate or vernacular medium till class 12th but these parents have very very high aspiration for english medium high quality learning for their for their students so that's what we are trying to solve and you know being able to do at a decent amount of scale our aspiration of course is to solve this for you know the 200000 affordable private schools in india over the next 5 to 7 years and that's the journey we are all, we are all on uh, you asked about impact so we basically measure five uh, impact points uh, when a school implements the lead system one is student distribution in a class you know so Uh, typically the problem has been that all classrooms in india have a normal curve of some people above average and then average and then below average and we kind of take it as a as a given as a truth of how schooling has to happen but what we see is that when we take on a school from only 29% students who are above 70% mastery uh, in baseline testing the class moves to 74% students being above 70% mastery so from 1/4 to 3/4 students moving about 70% mastery in just one year that's the change that happens in classroom distribution uh the second impact that we measure is uh, students literacy gap so typically when we do baseline assessment students have about 1.7 to 2 years of literacy gap versus grade level and in one year we cut it by half and in 2 to 3 years we bring them to grade level now coming to grade level is almost magical for a child because then they can independently read the math science social studies textbook which is in english which was earlier inaccessible and they had to resort to rote learning uh, so this is really important for english medium schools so that's on the student front on teacher performance we have a metric where we uh, when we begin our intervention teacher performance is typically at a scale of you know 5 they're typically at 2.5 uh, by end of year 1 it they typically move to about 4 and by year 2 our cohort is 4.5 and teacher performance is fundamentally about preparing teaching testing and then remediating which some of the great international schools do but in affordable schools this system has not really been set and implemented at scale uh then we move to parents so our parent metric is really parent satisfaction and nps amongst parents and we see that in in one year we are able to move it by 10 to 20 index points of nps of parents for these affordable schools and last because school these affordable private schools are businesses at the end of it uh admissions improvement by 10 to 15% in a year is what we measure so those are the five measurable impacts that we that we look at uh, and we are seeing that you know by implementing the lead school integrated system we are being able to fundamentally alter the way affordable private schools are run and the way students learn and as we continue 
expanding our partnership with more and more schools will keep making a dent in the quality of schooling available uh, to students across india so, yeah, so that's what we've been doing happy to take any questions later you don't mute namita i was i was thanking you for a wonderful presentation and being on time both thank you so much uh, so prateek maybe we can hear more about masai school and what you are building as well as the impact that you are creating now Thanks, thanks, Mr. Uh, so I'll quickly start with uh, why we started Masai School. So we believe that the traditional model of higher education is broken completely, and we believe that uh, like unfortunately, traditional colleges and universities have no incentives to basically uh, ensure that their graduates are getting hired. Uh, so they are getting paid regardless, and uh, that is one of the biggest problem. Area uh, which we have identified, and that's why we thought that Masai School uh, there there should be a better way of uh, approaching the education, uh, and uh, that better approach is that instead of asking a student to bet on us, uh, we should bet on them first, and then uh, we'll make sure that uh, once they are successful, then only we'll be successful. So uh, the Masai model is built around income share agreement. Uh, I'll just quickly tell you about how income share agreement works. Um, so our student don't pay us any upfront fees and once they graduate uh, and start earning above 5 lakhs per annum then only they pay us fees through their monthly salary uh, which is uh, capped at rupees 3 lakhs and it is uh, like they are going to pay us in a span of 3 years uh, and if they unfortunately uh, won't be able to get that job they don't pay us anything so it's it's a paradigm shifting model uh, that allow us to uh, align the incentive of the school with the incentive of the students and we all win when our students or our graduates succeed so that's that's the entire model of education that we work on uh, so i'll quickly tell you more about how the admission process works in masai school uh, majorly we look at only one thing uh, when we are selecting students the eligibility criteria is only 12th pass irrespective of their background irrespective of the the kind of uh, education uh, they had uh, so we only believe in one thing that uh, the motivation to learn and earn uh, should be at a very high level uh, like in the in the students those who are applying to masai school and that is the only thing that we check through our admission process majorly uh, it is not linked to uh, since we are a coding school uh we don't test their programming knowledge or anything we test their aptitude basic aptitude computer literacy typing speed and all these things which are going to be helpful for them to learn uh, uh learn programming uh in the sentence course that we have um so that's that's essentially how the admission process work and once we select the student they uh, they go through a 30 week rigorous program which is very intensive we follow 9 am to 9 pm 6 days a week which is the most important aspect of masai school very intensive and very hands on so the uh, the amount of hours that we spend on teaching them is hardly one or two hours in a day but uh, remaining 8 to 10 hours they they spend uh, doing hands on programming so by the end of the program they spend close to 1200 hours on uh programming which is roughly equivalent to 90% of the time that you spend as a computer science engineer during your four years uh, uh learning programming only uh so that's that's how uh, we make, basically make sure that by the end of the program they become full stack developers they become a great programmers and they get absorbed in companies uh, those who are like fast moving startups or uh, the tech mncs that we have um uh, the way we have designed the curriculum is that we have reverse engineered the entire curriculum so we have uh, close to 200 hiring partners now uh, so we keep on interacting with them we keep on updating uh, the curriculum which is the most important aspect which is lacking in the traditional colleges and universities so uh, the entire uh, entire curriculum is reverse engineered to make sure that students have those skill sets which are needed for them to become job ready uh, once they graduate from masai school uh and also not just programming we we focus on a holistic development of our individual so we focus uh, on the discipline aspect which is one of the most important thing uh, lacking in students uh, and so that's one very important thing on which we focus on people keep on calling us military style coding school but that's how we are and uh, second important thing is that we focus a lot on the soft skills and now since uh, the next set of uh, uh, million tech jobs which are going to be created majority of them are going to be remote so how to make them remote ready as well is something which which is also a biggest 
uh, like the most important element that we focus on while during their curriculum of 30 weeks uh, and the important thing which happens after the end of it is that they they end up getting a job and they end up getting uh, not just changing their life but their entire family life so that's that's the most important element uh, but one more thing which i wanted to uh, uh, which i was hearing uh, uh, so we're speaking about it uh, and uh, this is one very important thing which is the core of uh, what Masai school do so there is a there's a problem um, which is bloom sigma 2 problem which is which has been solved when we uh, when when the education become more personalized so in Masai school uh, we follow a mastery based progression which means that the entire course curriculum of Masai school is divided into six seven modules and uh, for after crossing every module, you have to demonstrate the mastery of that module. And if you, unfortunately, if you're not able to cross that particular module, then we work on, we work with those students, uh, for, uh, like we work with those students on their weak areas in a very personalized manner and try to basically attack those weak points so that once they are confident about it, then only they move forward. So essentially, it's very very expensive. Like in a, in a, in one particular batch, we have like three four batches ongoing, uh, but. Uh, this is all uh, like we all we all work towards it because we want to make sure that they they have the best outcome uh, once they graduate from Masai school and as a result if you'll see like uh, from the impact perspective in last uh, in last one year of operation we have graduated more than 100 students our placement rate is around 89 percent and at the same point of time uh, we have been able to increase the annual income of our graduates uh, by more than six hundred thousand uh, dollars in just one year time, and that has been the impact that is the most uh, important thing for us. And at the same point of time, uh, uh, this has not changed them, uh, but their entire families, uh, which I which I was saying earlier. And at the same point of time, uh, this mastery based progression has helped us to identify that people those who have slow learning curves. How can they uh, are not falling behind, and how can they uh, uh, not get demotivated because the class is moving at a fast speed? And how can they also get confident by the end of the program and get job ready? So that's that's essentially what uh, what Masai School is all about. Uh, so I think like uh, I'd love to answer questions about this. Thanks, Thanks, Prati. Uh, so let's hear from Vidan uh, from Pradeep about Vedantu's model. He's joined Vedantu recently. He was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Namita. I'm yeah, part of the leadership team at Vedantu. Uh, one of the founders was supposed to be here. I'm sorry, as the emergency came up and as a result, they could not make it. I'll try my best to give their perspective uh, and my perspective too. Uh, uh, see, uh, as most of you know, Vedantu is an online uh, tutoring company, right? It's, it's about live tutoring. The way it started was that, you know, uh, founders were running, uh, you know, exam prep to, uh, institutes called Laksh uh, in different parts of India, in Northern India, which was more of an offline model. Very successful. Uh, but at the same time, they kind of realized that this is not actually helping them, enabling them to scale, uh, like, uh, the good call access to good quality education the way they would have liked to and that is what basically initiated them to kind of innovate and move towards a live tutoring model so that's kind of the genesis of how uh, Vedantu started um, but also uh, the way basically it has evolved though it started off more with focus on like you know uh, exam prep uh, towards JE or NEET uh, where it also evolved to focus more on uh, tutoring for grades 1 to 10 as well. So now it's kind of a full-fledged grades 1 to 12 uh, online live tutoring. But I just want to add here that it's more of a full service model uh, rather than a supplementary uh, service to the students. So essentially, when I say full service model, what I mean is that it's it has both in-class and out-of-class activities. In-class, there is live tutoring by teachers, there is interaction among students, there is interaction between students and teachers, there is all the things that happen in a good classroom. But at the same time, there is a lot of support that is provided to students outside of the class as well. Like it could be academic mentoring that is provided to students, it can be doubt solving, it can be assignments, projects, 
and uh, ass uh, assessments, tests, different kinds of engagement that happens outside uh, uh, of the class. And that's essentially how the kind of the Vedantu uh, delivery mechanism works. Mostly the way students engage with us, they start uh, by engaging with Vedantu in one form or another. It could be through, let's say, a YouTube channel or they take a micro course or they take like a, um, a trial uh, master class etc. They get to try, they get to test uh, the value that they derive out of the uh, Vedantu model and then post that they, once they are convinced and they trust and that's when they become, they take up more uh, longer term courses which is for the entire uh, academic year. So that's pretty much uh, what the Vedantu model is now which is spreading across uh, grades uh, 1 to 12. And in terms of uh, numbers, uh, like, you know, we saw all those numbers that Namita presented uh, and those are true and, uh, and, and probably a lot more. You took look at any of the uh, numbers at Vedantu compared to January to where we are today. It could be uh, traffic that we're talking about. Uh, it could be a number of students who are uh, actively engaging on the Vedantu platform or the paid subscribers or even the revenue. I think everything what we have seen is threefold to fourfold growth in the last six to eight months. And that has been the kind of tailwind that we have seen. And that has been the kind of uh, growth that we have seen. But that has also mean that it has, while it has accelerated adoption in a big way, uh, but that, that has also meant that there are a lot of challenges that we have had to work on. Uh, more like in terms of the product innovation that we do. I think primarily, if I want to zero in, what is that like, you know, one or two big challenges. One is how do we solve for scale? Uh, two is how do we solve for affordability? Uh, like, for example, how do we make it like really available far and wide, but still make it inexpensive, but not compromising on the quality of uh, education, given that we are more like a full service model. Uh, how do we not compromise on the quality of education and still control the cost? And that's where we have been doing a lot of innovation, like, you know, uh, simulated live classes instead of full-fledged live classes. So that it also decreases the bandwidth requirement for access of uh, the Vedantu live classes. And uh, at the same time, it is more affordable uh, to uh, students as well. That's just one example. Like, or for example, let's say, uh, we had to turn around our entire, uh, you know, sales model as to how we used to basically create outreach to students uh, from uh, our feet on street uh, model to how do we bring everything online and how entire, uh, like, you know, 1,500 people in the sales team had to basically shift to providing demo and, uh, and using the Vedantu delivery platform itself to engage parents and students, um, etc. So those are uh, some of the innovation. Third is like, uh, also what Namita mentioned in her uh, presentation, how do we create a holistic experience uh, uh, to the learners and there's a lot of innovation that has gone into making uh, the students experience more holistic, be it in class, uh, be it out of class uh, uh, and there is a lot of technological innovation in making that experience uh, kind of a relishing experience for the, for the students. Uh, that's uh, another area there where we have seen a lot of uh, work to, uh, with this whole accelerated uh, adoption. When it comes to the impact itself, I think um, first and foremost, of course, we have the uh, grade 10, grade 12, the JEE, the needs, uh, all these are, you know, uh, while there are many other different ways to measure uh, outcomes and impact, but we also need to balance these are gateways to opportunities and these exams are equally important for us. So if you look at any of these metrics, like for example, grade 10, grade 12, CBSC or ICSC results, uh, Vedantu students are like, you know, percentage of students who scored more than 90% has been like more than 3x or 4x of what it is across Pan India. Similarly, you know, what has been uh, uh, an amazing achievement for the first time um, uh, in the online tutoring world is for Vedantu is, especially for Vedantu is that like, if you look at the current JE advanced results, uh, it's the first time that an online tutoring company has produced 500 All India ranks through an online tutoring uh, model. Uh, so that's that's a, been a significant achievement uh, compared to where we started a couple of years ago uh, uh, with the JE. We have different kinds of models, which is one is to one, one is to few, and one is to many. Uh, uh, those are uh, different uh, ways in which we kind of deliver our uh, program. 
In addition to these uh, exam based results, what we have also done is we have taken significant strides in how do we personalize the student learning. And this is where, you know, uh, measurement of learning outcomes and monitoring student learning growth. So essentially what we have taken is a very growth mindset, which means we understand that students could be in a learning continuum and they could be anywhere in the continuum at a point in time. And what we are trying to do is at every engagement level, we are measuring students learning growth and trying to create iterative feedback into the system. So that that system becomes self-correcting and at the same time, it creates a personalized uh, experience uh, for students. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, now let me uh, bring in back uh, Sumi. Um, uh, uh, from B2B uh, or for in-school sector, head tech, right? it has been some times you know, from both investors' perspective or the growth of the businesses' perspective. Right? How are you seeing uh, tailwinds in fact? And I don't want to use only the COVID-19 tailwinds. Right? There is, there is increasingly been tailwinds for the last one, one and a half years in the tech phase. What are you seeing in this sector changing both from uh, businesses' perspective Entrepreneurs' perspective and investors' interest. Uh, Namita, I think uh, three to three to four years back, when we first started to raise uh, institutional funding, I think one thing that we came up with was that, uh, unfortunately, B two B school uh, is is a little bit tarnished by history. You know, I would I would say that uh, it's gone through. I would say two rounds. Uh, one is when the first uh, wave of smart classes hit the school business. I think uh, the intention of bringing audiovisual learning to classrooms was great, uh, but somewhere I think we lost track and the way it was executed, it created uh, some bit of bad blood between schools and service providers and, you know, and then investors, I think, burned their hands and that led when that scar i think took some time uh, for the b2b school segment to kind of emerge from then the second wave was this whole curriculum wave where you know a lot of companies went in uh, with the assumption that uh, learning is not happening well because teachers don't have the right lesson plans or curriculums and you know that will solve uh, and again there was a wave which which happened uh, adoption was high retention was low and they they started to become a narrative that in schools, you know, uh, collections and retentions are a big problem and therefore there were not a lot of people who were willing to touch it. Uh, we in fact didn't build lead school uh, as in with the intention of raising a lot of money, right? I mean, our intention of setting up lead school was that I was personally pained by my own experience of growing up in a small town and getting the education that I got and seeing it for myself and wanted to solve it. Uh, but when we came to a point where we started seeing results uh, of the integrated way of uh, implementing and when we went out i think what we saw was that uh, ultimately you require one person to back you and a proof of concept to start to start develop uh, since then you know in the last three years i think a lot has changed because uh, some of the assumptions which people had which was about collection retention all of the, those, I think we've been able to actually uh, really supersede by a huge margin. So sometimes when we share our numbers, people have a huge disbelief that is this really true? Uh, so we've got to kind of over, overcome that. But I see that, you know, uh, in our latest round, we actually, we saw that there were a lot of growth stage funds who are now uh, willing to kind of get past that history of B2B ed tech and look at solutions which, uh, are approaching the problem very differently, you know, and uh, like first principle system based thinking in terms of how to solve uh, the problem, I, I think works. Uh, now, if I look at the, the future, I think uh, it's hard not to pay attention to what COVID has actually brought to the school system. I think there is definitely uh, a short term impact on schools in terms of, you know, their ability to collect fees from parents uh, and some of the low fee schools have actually struggled. But if you ask me, I think what has really happened is that we spoke about unbundling earlier in the conversation. Uh, everybody has suddenly realized that schools essentially have been performing three functions. Uh, one is assisted learning, which is, you know, the teacher mediated learning, which students below 12 definitely need cognitively and developmentally 
but the other two things which were not well recognized was that school performed a very important role of peer groups and peer group learning and socializing right that socializing skills was a really important role that schools uh, were playing and the third one was daycare right parents really wanted the kids off their back to be able to do their household chores or do their work uh, and what covid taught us was that the value of a school fee was actually an amalgamation of these three benefits and when the sec the second and the third went away there was a resistance from parents to want to pay full value because one of the big reasons why they were wanting why they were sending students to school went away uh, now now my sense is this is a short term hit uh, it has its pros and cons you know the day the vaccine is announced i think parents are sure and parents are sure that it is uh, safe to send kids to school schools will bounce back because parents cannot afford to not send their children to school especially because of the second two reasons i mentioned right? and daycare is a really important one so the long term secular role of schools i think in child development is there to stay but the nature of schooling is definitely going to change uh, in the short term what's going to happen is that as schools reopen they won't open all at once it they are going to be operating in a hybrid model of online offline for anywhere between 3 to 6 and even 9 months uh so what's going to happen is they will need to by force leverage technology and systems to achieve that the whole uh, connectedness between online and offline and currently schools are not ready so they will need uh, system operators like us and maybe uh, you know other people who can actually perform that role to help student uh, schools run in a hybrid mode the second thing that's going to be immediately useful is that when schools reopen they will need strong baseline assessments and remediations to account for the learning loss that has happened over the last 6 to 9 months uh, and this also is a massive access exercise both in government and private schools which will require technology which will require systems so i think in the short term there's going to be like a i would say short term boost that schools will need to just ensure that they are able to work on a hybrid mode and they are able to uh, assess and remediate over the medium to long term i think one thing across the uh, board when when we talking to schools they hearing is that they have understood their traditional way of running a school is massively outdated the covid shock has told them that they didn't have a lot of bargaining power with parents if they weren't delivering quality and they realized that a large part of why parents were sending kids to school was as daycare and for social training not really for learning because they were supplementing through tuitions uh, and when it came to learning schools were found wanting because now the classrooms were at home so parents were able to see what teachers were actually doing earlier they would just leave the students at the gate so a lot of scrutiny has come into schools and schools are feeling pressure to up their game so they will need to do that and become future ready my sense is that there there's going to be a massive adoption of technology and innovation in schools and uh, three things will happen personalized learning will come up connected learning will come up in schools and all learning in schools now is going to be at the intersection of technology and curriculum so the old world of publishers and stuff will go away uh so that's what really we are we are looking at uh, schools uh, we ourselves are seeing now a large uptick of school additions in the last two months we have seen almost six to seven schools getting added every day to our to our uh, portfolio of partner schools so schools are realizing they need systems and technology it's a good thing uh, for the future well i'm being told that we have limited time so maybe we'll uh I'll uh, hear from Pratik on what he is seeing on the post K twelve side, and then we have a couple of audience questions um, that I will direct to the respective people. So, Pratik, anything that you are seeing in terms of what is your perspective on where this is headed, uh, the post K twelve upskilling side, and what the tailwinds have uh, been for this? So, Mamita, I think uh, we have uh, we have been maintaining the status quo, and uh, I think like if you'll see. Um, we are growing uh, uh, irrespective of covid we are growing uh, in terms of batch sizes and the demand from the from the students one very important thing which has happened through covid is uh, i think uh, things that we were anticipating which is going to happen after 5 years is probably accelerated a lot uh, coding is going to be the second language in the world is something which is being reinforced now uh, and uh, not just uh, because of this uh, most of the jobs are going to be automated and everyone is working towards it so that has been one of the biggest thing which has which has happened and at the same point of time i think when i was saying uh, uh like most of the tech jobs the future jobs are going to be remote um, and india already contributed around 23 23.5% of uh, um tech 
uh, techies across the world. Uh, so I think uh, this will give us uh, the all the all the uh, players in this market will uh, they'll be having an opportunity to not just uh, solve for India but also make this uh, take the Indian students, skill them, and present it to the global companies as well at the same point of time. So like, since it is going to be remotely, I think uh, uh, we can actually help those uh, underserved markets with the quality talent from India. Uh, it will skill them properly uh, because of uh, the. Like th this is one of the biggest transitions which I'm seeing uh, uh, both from the demand side as well as from the hiring uh, uh, partner side. Thanks. Uh, there is a question specifically for Prachi um, uh, related to the Himachal Pradesh model. Um, has the Himachal government school model for out of school learning found acceptance in other states? Are there further plans to optimize it in this state? Yes, there is Namata. There are, uh, you know, at least I am aware of five or six other states which are following such asynchronous learning networks. It's uh, Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, Jharkhand, uh, Haryana, and Rajasthan. Um, the variance over there and the numbers are not so uh, so positive in those because it's a direct factor of the access. So the biggest bottleneck that I'm seeing right now is not the state's willingness, desire, or parents' or children's ability to adopt technology to actually do device and internet access. So there are states which are as low as 5-10% in terms of access and enrollment of kids just because the kids don't have device. So that's a, that's a big unsolved problem as I'm seeing adoption of such models. Thank you. I have a question which is not directed to anyone specific. So volunteers uh, invited uh, so what are non government what are affordable schools going to do to revive themselves i think partly this question was answered by sumi uh, the second part of the question is with the government recognizing coding as a life skill will this create ppp kind of affordable edtech platforms for such schools so maybe if any investor on the panel wants to take this up and then maybe we can then go back to sumi if you want to complete that question So let me repeat it, right? So, so for example, government has now started to recognize coding as a life skill or other things that the schools now need to start adopting. Uh, do we see new business models, opportunities for ed tech companies um, uh, to to either you know to start delivering to these things or even create PPP models with government uh, or affordable private schools for these things? What is your take on that? I can take a stab, Manita, and then maybe another colleagues can other colleagues can add. So, in terms of recognition, as per NEP, yes, that's a great step forward. Uh, it is included as one of the things which should be included in the curriculum. Uh, also, there is uh, increased dialogue around uh, PPP in education, where edtech companies can participate because not just for encoding skills, you know, the new NEP also talks about extensive use of technology, student-facing technology, all the work that the government has done so far has much more been, you know, uh, teacher-facing technology. So there is increased dialogue around student-facing technology as well. So both of those uh, make me think that there should be increased opportunities for private sector participation. But I think, you know, that is still a few years away for us. Um, we don't jump on that as something which is coming up and opening up immediately because the whole, you know, what the government could have done to make it an immediately realizable thing was if we had actually shifted our procurement method. So if you see that, you know, the policy still remains closed on procurement, on budgeting, on all of those things. And that has always been the problem in private sector participation in the government. So, uh, so there is definitely opportunity, but till we actually start solving on the procurement side, private sector will not be able to participate and will not be able to will not want to participate if the you know if the cash flows are uh, are at risk or are not guaranteed yeah i completely agree with that and i think there's a the larger role by the ecosystem and philanthropic dollars to be played there in terms of even 
Namita, if I can... creation for governments to start believing in. Nira, were you saying something? Yeah, so if I can jump in, you know, uh, the Atal Tinkering Labs, that was a very nice initiative, I thought. I, I haven't sort of followed that up. I don't know uh, where that is right now. Mm-hmm. This whole uh, scheme of the government providing hardware and some level of uh, OPEC support to uh, select schools, uh, which I thought took the whole thing to the next level because coding uh, is great, right? But then what we need to move beyond coding to is this whole maker labs. Uh, because eventually, unless uh, you know, children are playing with things, they are making and breaking, it will be very difficult to internalize concepts. I mean, coding is great from the perspective of developing logic and, but then to apply those that logic not to make software work, but also uh, hardware work in, in a manner that, you know, for example, automation is enabled. I thought it was uh, uh, a great step. And something like that uh, opens up room for private sector participation as well, because I know that at that point, the government all, had also come up with uh, contracts for a private sector to appoint uh, facilitators uh, to help teachers adopt these uh, uh, tinkering labs uh, at the schools. But like I said, I haven't followed that up, so don't know where that is right now. Yeah, no, that's a great example. I think we have time for one last question, and there is an audience question for Prati. How profitable is Maasai schools pay only when hired model? Can you talk a little bit more about the economics? Uh, so the, uh, obviously, like uh, it, it is on a very expensive side, but at the same point of time, uh, I think um, the the margins on which we are working on uh, in Masai school, because we are remote only, uh, it is around uh, 70%. Uh, and that's that's one of the most important thing uh, to make it a, a profitable business. Uh, but uh, I think uh, profit, uh, like we work with NBFCs to underwrite uh, the, uh, to underwrite the, uh, once a student get placed, then uh, uh, they underwrite it and they, they give us the amount uh, upfront, but we follow the true ISA. So that means when when a student graduates and uh, uh, start earning above it, then they start paying it to the NBFCs because they are the ones who collect the cash. But after that, once they uh, like if they are out of job because of any reason or they they are not uh, working uh, because of any reason, uh, then their ISA get paused. So that's one very important factor because ISA is all about when the student is earning, then only they should be paying. Otherwise, they should not be. So I think we are uh, we are cash flow positive, uh, and uh, that's. I think I I hope I answered the question. You spoke about gross margin being seventy percent after. Yeah. What about your CAC? Can you sh- shed that light on that? that yeah. So we don't have CAC as such uh, because uh, you don't charge any upfront fees from the students. Uh, that's when you have uh, 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 like we have close to uh, seven to eight thousand applications for every batch, and we start batches every alternate month. Uh, and uh, the last batch was around ten thousand application, and that is something which was the maximum uh, that we have received for one particular batch. And we have for only seats like hundred seats uh, per batch. Now we are increasing it. So. We don't have CAC as of now, uh, but probably, yes, we are very small. Uh, uh, once we'll start uh, having courses every month, then probably we might have to spend some, some money on marketing. No, but that's the beauty of the model. Uh, the ISA uh, becomes a trust hack and a financing hack both. Right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so with that, I think I am ready to thank everyone. I know we would have each one of us. I would have liked to share more insights. I, I myself felt a little less satisfied, but I think total as a whole, this was a very satisfying session, and it was good to hear and see everyone. So thank you once again from my behalf. Yeah. Thanks, Amita. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Neha, you are on mute. Yes, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Namita, for such an engaging moderation and a special thanks to you and Prachi for helping us curate this session. Uh, thank you, panelists, for an insightful discussion. Innovation seems to be surely the word of the hour. With that positive note, we now move to the next round table of day four, another illustrious panel comprising of veterans from different walks of impact. 
Uh, please join us for the roundtable on state of impact measurement and management in India with the much awaited launch of the IIC KPMG report, which, which continues in Audi 1. Thank you, everyone, and good evening.